Hello, I think I'm live. There we go. And and hello, John. Thanks very much for coming on. This is How to Diorama with Scale Modelcraft. I am Bill. Um, I'm kind of a hyperactive guy over here. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for coming on, John, because I, I hadn't seen you in a couple of weeks. And it was really neat uh, because I had done one of the things that you had, had questioned about. Uh, and I screwed up your name and all that kind of stuff because I've got another friend named John Harrison lives in, in Ireland, which uh, he's actually going to be on the show uh, uh, here in the future. Uh, so I got your name all messed up. But thank you very much, John. Uh, John Robeck is here. Thanks very much, John. Really nice to see you. Uh, Paul Christopher is here. Thanks very much for coming on, Paul. Uh, if I could paint this here. Thanks very much. Hey, if I could paint, I'm sorry I got back to you so late. I think I saw your thing in, in your your message and just didn't get back to you uh, for a while. But thanks everybody. Thanks very much. I'm just like stumbling over my stuff. Thanks very much for everybody for coming by today. It's really wonderful. Hey, Scott's here. Thanks very much uh, for coming in, Scott. Um, it's all good. Thank you. Great. Well, you know, today was really fun. Um, I've had just a wild week. Um, last Saturday, after our last um, live stream, my friend called me up and said, you know, and, and, and I had done this before, uh, a week before or weekend or two, um, had some extra wood. Uh, his, his neighbor was moving and he has a really nice wood shop. And so I was able to get some wood because he was clearing out his wood shop. But I also got some great tools. And so this week I have been working on the diorama, which is just over here. And we're going to talk a lot about that today, where I'm at. And I also got a chance to, you know, get some new wood in here and just reorganize the shop. So it was a lot of fun this week. So I, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is what we're doing here. And, and if anybody has any questions right off the bat, I would love to hear from you. Hey, Eric is here. Thanks very much, Eric. I appreciate you coming in. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and start um, because I have a couple of things to go over. We're going to look at alien plants. Uh, and, and I want to talk more about alien plants, not just the plants that I'm doing, but maybe my process of trying to figure out what an alien plant is going to be. Um, and then uh, we're going to uh, use some, um, uh, we're also going to use some um, spices. I'm going to use mustard seeds. And so for the mustard seeds, I don't, I just wanted to make this statement here that, that you should be really, really careful because I have seen older dioramas like in museums and stuff like that, that have bugs in them. And the bugs are going to look for something to eat. And so, unfortunately, if you put something in your diorama that they want to eat, they're going to get in your diorama and they're going to start eating it. And then you're going to have bugs in your diorama. So be careful. Gather, clean, sort, and store all of the stuff that you use. Like if you're gathering stuff outside, outside materials, sticks, grass, whatever. Don't put freshly cut stuff into a diorama. Don't think the glue will preserve it. It won't. So it's it's really important to be careful of that stuff. And I'd love to answer any other questions. Um, John is here. And John, uh, John um, Robeck, um, he and I have talked a lot about this because there's a neat, um, there's a neat process using glycerin to soak your plant material in. And that will preserve it. But it will also... Um, keep it from going stiff and falling apart like roots can sometimes do. The other thing I want you to be cog cognizant of is I want you to prevent bugs and any funguses from growing in your diorama. So when I said earlier that maybe you should, you know, uh, gather, clean, sort, and store, store is not just a secondary thing. I think the storing helps you figure out if something is in it. When I st put stuff in jars, I've sorted it all out, I've cleaned it, and I've got my materials that I'm gonna use and it's in a jar, I can look at that jar and I've contained whatever the heck might be in it and I can see that it's no longer there. Um, sometimes you can put stuff in a microwave, but don't, do, don't put anything in the microwave that's still wet 
That's not what you want to do. If you do that to a stick, it can make the stick swell up and, and it can just lose. Like if it's waterlogged or something like that, it can lose the look that you want. So first things first, take those raw materials from outside. Um, and I'll, I'll switch the view here a little bit. It's probably a little bit more appropriate. Um, Take the finds that you, the, the things that you find outside, dry them, and you can dry them for a long time. I dry stuff for years, literally. And then it's okay to, to use it in your diorama. You make sure there's bugs out of it. It's not growing anything in it. Um, be careful of some mosses. Some plants have the ability to come to life many years after they've been plucked. Uh, uh, mosses will do that. It can be a dead, dry moss. You add water, it starts growing again. So be cautious of that. I've used that stuff in my diorama, and that's why I say. Okay, I've got some comments here. Thank you very much. Uh, I have never noticed that huge paintbrush. Where's that huge paintbrush? Oh, up here. This guy right up here. That is just a bench brush. And, you know, sometimes you have like an artist brush and it's kind of long and you can kind of brush your bench off. Those are really cool, but it's just a paintbrush and I just keep it super clean. So I'm not going to get anything on it. You know, it's not a used one. It's a, a new one, a clean one. And I just use it to, to kind of brush off the, um, the desk, you know, when it gets particularly gnarly. Uh, John Hayes had a crazy, amazing idea for you and everyone to try make a poster that in fact, it's a 3D diorama with characters, key elements protruding outwards causing. Yeah, I really like that idea. That's really cool. I have seen some people do paintings like that and, and you know, like uh, wall relief or shadow box dioramas, but having it come out, that would be very cool. I like that idea, John. And I do want to get back to this thing that I was talking about before because I, man, it's around here somewhere. Everybody, this is like totally unprofessional, but I think I see it. I'm going to be right back. Okay. So this right here is some of the cloth that I use to make straps for Ichiro. And I don't have a picture of Ichiro right now, but this fabric is the same fabric that I use for pretty much all the stuff that I do. And while we were talking about this a number of weeks ago, um, John Hayes asked, have you used the Mod Podge in water on the fabric? And I said, no, I use starch. I use sizing because it works great. Well, after that, I used it. I did try it. And this, this is the result. This is brilliant, John. So what I did was I soaked this in the Mod Podge and water, 50-50 cut. Not ridiculously, but everything was wet. And then I hung it. Uh, by like a little clothesline in the shop and the it, it you know soaked out and it was not wet enough to drip if that helps so it hung and it dried out and it dried out and there's a stiffness to it that makes it super cool for cutting it cuts fantastic also it has all the fiber in there so if you cut it you still or paint it after you cut it if you paint it, you still see the fiber in there. So for a strap, which is what I used it for, it looks great. And it's a lot easier to work with because it's so much stiffer than like the sizing or the starch that I was using on the cloth before. So John Hayes, thank you so much. That is so brilliant. That is the best idea. And it's just so simple, but thank you so much. You thought of it. I hadn't even thought of it. I've been using both these different things in my shop for years. Never tried it once. Tried it the first time. It's now my go-to. That's so awesome. So everybody, if you want to do this, I just took a little bit of this cloth, Mod Podge, half water, wet it, hung it, clothespins. We all got those for modeling. Hung it. Once it dried, like I said, it's almost got like a... You know, you can hear it. It's a nice, stiff uh, uh, result. Cuts brilliantly. That's a cut side. It's really sharp. So anyway, I'm just thrilled with it. I love it when I find new stuff like that. And John Hayes, thank you very much. That was you uh, suggesting that. So that was just brilliant, sir. Uh, Eric has to say, what did you do to protect, preserve the mustard seeds? Very, very good point. So this is the point that I, I, I was on before, before I went on my John Hayes tangent, but I loved it. Um, when you're doing this, 
you don't want to use, number one, a lot of water. The mustard seeds themselves uh, sometimes have a little husk. Well, they all have a little husk. And you put a little bit too much water on it, and it'll kind of disintegrate, and that husk will come open. And then your, your, your seed falls apart. So first things first, don't use a lot of water on it, okay? Because that could make the husk break down, and then your seeds just go to mush. Number two, when you're painting, and I'm going to show you a picture here because that's exactly what I did. Um, here are the mustard seeds. Um, I'm going to show you a bigger picture so you can see them better. Uh, these are the mustard seeds. There are small variations. Um, they're, they're not all complete, but for 135th scale, they're perfect for like uh, fruit. Uh, absolutely perfect sized for fruit. Um, if we look at the scale... Here's a, uh, a pencil next to them. So I really like them. Now I'm using them as, as some kind of fruit at 120th scale. So it's small like a berry, but um, these are great. So the first thing I do <clears throat> is paint only uh, and use as little water as possible. Uh, I think that's really important. Like I was saying, I'm going to try to get my head out of there. Um, that husk can come loose. And it even did it with just the paint. So this is uh, non-thinned uh, Vallejo model color acrylic paint. It is just purple, just the plain purple. And I just wanted some color because what I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to introduce colors inside and not outside uh, because outside we know is like desert. So here it is. Uh, I... Uh, once they were painted and separated, it's it's a good idea. And we're going to show you that because I'm going to show you a live demo on how to paint these things. Um, and then separated, then I could individually glue those on with a little bit of Mod Podge. Um, and they went on great. The pattern I chose, I just tried to put them on with equal distance between them. And there are some points in here where I've got different colored yarn underneath. I stayed away from the darker yarn. I just tried to keep it, or wool, I should say, sorry. I just tried to keep it to the, um, the lighter colored wool. And, and, and I like the effect. And again, the, the spacing on them was just trying to keep them equally spaced. So when I have three or four, I'm just trying to keep them equally spaced, about a quarter of an inch between each of them. And, and I thought that was interesting. It, it set them across there almost like a matrix pattern. And, and I, I really liked it. Um, I had the pattern kind of going up the wall and then into the upper structure. And then there is one of my flowers and, and, and I'll talk to you about the flowers, uh, you know, when we're doing this other stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's what I did to put them on. And then there's later on, we're going to, we're going to look at that, um, and, and do some more on the, uh, on the live demo. Sorry. I'm trying to get over here and swatch the, there we go. So, um, so yeah, so after I painted them, after I glued them on with Mod Podge, after I did the little white dot, it's just white paint. Then I came back and a little thicker than the 50-50 Mod Podge in water, but certainly not straight Mod Podge. And then I coated each and every one, just like a drop. And then I kind of went back in with a dry brush and wicked it away. And that was for Eric. Eric was saying, hey, how do you protect, preserve them? I did it with Mod Podge and I hope that's gonna work. I'm just, I'm trying to encapsulate those things with that white glue and, and hoping that's gonna do it. I don't think it's a bad idea once I'm done painting here to even do a little TS-80, some flat, because I don't necessarily want, maybe there's places I want a little bit of shine, but typically I want this flat. And, and so I'm probably going to, I say probably, I, I'm not sure yet, because I also have to do some water. And I don't think that TS-80 on water is going to be a great idea. So the whole point is, yeah, I, I would possibly put some TS-80 on there as well. Something to coat it, something to keep water from soaking into it. The other thing I'm trying to do, back to the bug thing, I don't want to put anything that's food in my diorama, right? Anything that an animal, like a small insect or a worm or whatever, that's going to be a little like a, a, a bugs, you know, whatever the heck, um, 
I don't want that to get in my diorama. So by coating it, I'm trying to do that too. Now, I've done this technique on mustard seeds before, and it's worked great. I don't think it's a bad idea to continuously coat it with something after it dries. You don't want to keep too much moisture on it because it could absorb that moisture instead of letting that moisture wick off. You know what I mean? And, and I don't want that to kind of break down. So I, I placed those on there. I think they did great. Uh, again, my pattern, I like it. But let's talk a little bit more about an alien plant. I mean, what, what, you know, what was my process of coming up with it? Well, I had other plants, remember? I, I made some other plants, and these were plants that were cut out from, uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Tim, here uh, locally. And um, they're cut out of Aura Mask 810. And they work great. They're mounted on wire. But they're terrestrial plants. They're earth plants, right? And we're on, a, we're on an alien world here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out something that is easily recognizable, right? I don't want to put something in there that people are going, that doesn't fit, or I don't, I don't get it, or something like that. So it's got to be easily recognizable. The other thing that I was trying to do, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the, the diorama here just to, to demonstrate. The other thing I want to do here was on this side of it, and I've got the, the little side cover off right now, is this side is desert, right? It's just super dry, desolate sand. There's nothing out there. And, and it's almost that singular palette of color, right? It's just this, this sand color, ochre, or whatever it is. Um, but then inside, when you turn it, I want a lot of color. I want a vibrancy. I want to show that, you know, inside the habitat, inside the geodesic dome, there's been success and we're growing plant life. And, and, and I think that's really important. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's important at all. It's just part of my idea to, to demonstrate the disparity between the outside and the inside and the fact that this is like an, a miraculous thing that's happened. So um, that's how I put it in there. Um, I've got a few more comments and I want to make sure that I get everybody. Um, uh, and then uh, John Robeck says the glisten trick works great. So now, Eric, this is another thing. Now, I, I didn't think about doing the mustard seeds and glycerin. And by glycerin, what I mean is I watched a video by uh, Luke Talon many years ago, and he showed how to take maybe some plants or some roots or something like that that you want to preserve for a long time, and you put them in glycerin. Puts it in warm glycerin and water, and then lets it sit overnight. Maybe I did two weeks. I, I didn't know. Um, but then take it out of there. It's not slimy. You dry it off, you know, let it dry out. It's not slimy or anything like that, but it stays subtle, right? And subtle is, is really important for roots. When you get those roots out of their moist environment, they become so brittle, they'll just shatter and, and, and shatter like in animation shatter, I guess. Uh, and so if you put that on your diorama, well, it's fine. Sure, it's going to be fine. But if you should ever touch it, Gosh, it could shatter. By utilizing the glycerin, that keeps it subtle. And so you can bump it. It stays soft and moist because the glycerin replaces the water inside that. It, it, it never gets brittle. And you can still glue it and you can still paint it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a brilliant trick. So um, if you want to try that, you can gl get glycerin at uh, like the... Um, not the hardware store, but like at the pharmacy or something like that has glycerin and it's just small bottles and it's not very expensive and it's great for preserving stuff. For these, I didn't think that was necessary. That's more for a plant or a leaf you want to do. Um, and that would be fine. The other thing is if you're doing that, that's pretty much going to kill anything that's in it, you know, submerged in glycerin for a few days you're not going to have anything in it. So it's, it, it, it is a really good way to go about it. Um, so great question. And, and, and also great response from John Mark. Hello. Very nice to see you, sir. How are you? Um, and, and John Hayes says when using organic live things for dioramas, they rot and break down over time. Yeah, they sure will. And, and that's what I was saying before. I, I, I initially thought that, boy, if I just coat it, right it will be fine. Now the seeds I think are okay. There's just, it's seeds are pretty dense, right? But a twig, 
let's say you want something that looks like a log in your diorama, over time, even if it's coated with something and, and there's like a break in that coating, if a bug gets in it, then I think there's a danger of it just kind of getting literally eaten from the inside out. Um, you don't want that to happen. So um, you want to get the bugs out of it. You want to get any anything that might be living in it. You can take a very dried, previously dried, don't put wet sticks in your microwave, but you can take a dry stick and put it in a microwave and do it for a very short amount of time, 20, 30 seconds. It doesn't have to be long. And after it's been dried, for a long time and then you've put it in there and then you zap it with the microwave. There's nothing living in that thing. So then I think you're just fine. Then you can just dunk it in something clear. Uh, Mod Podge is fine. It it dries very thin, very clear, very flat, depending on what Mod Podge you use. And, and, and I think then you've done a really nice job. Now I have taken like a whole thing before and put on the back wall of one of my dioramas. I did it on um, uh, Indiana Jones diorama and display case that I built last year. Um, that thing um, I coated really, really well with Mod Podge and um, I did not do the, the glycerin. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking, man, I might have to go back and change that. Now it's a little bit thicker, so it might not be bad, really tiny, you know, things that we might put in here, that's where you got to watch out. They just become very brittle and they just poof, they, they blow away. So be very careful with that. Um, the other thing is, is if you should go to your diorama and maybe it's in an enclosure, right? You've done it and it's in an enclosure and you go to it and you smell something. That's plant material. If you should, your, your, your diorama should have no smell right? There may be some solvent smells, some paint smells, things that you're used to in doing dioramas and things of that nature, but there should be no kind of rotting smell. There shouldn't be any fungal smell. There shouldn't be anything like that. Number one, look for moisture. If you're in a high moisture, high humidity area, that could be problematic. I don't know. You have to dehumidify your home in those areas, but it could also affect your diorama if you've got a lot of material in there that can gather water. Um, so yeah, be careful of those things really. And, and like I say, if you go to it and you smell something, something's growing, that's plant material and that's not good. You don't want that. So you need to get all that biology out of there ahead of time and be really careful about it. I like to gather my materials when I'm not needing them, obviously, and, and let them sit for a while. I have most certainly grabbed something out of the yard and brought it back in and worked on it and pfft, it's right in there, you know, but I just don't think it's real smart anymore. You know, I've just, as I've, I've grown in this and learned more and, and, and have had these. And, and that's the, I guess the nice thing about my dioramas, I've had my dioramas here in the shop for years. So I can see the effects of time. I can see the effects of it. It's not like I, I built the diorama and then it went to somebody's home and I, I, I don't get to see any interaction with it. And I do interact with my dioramas. I move them. I take them to shows. I, I, I have to, you know, uh, I'm changing this or whatever the case may be. I am physically interacting with them. So I'm seeing how they're holding up. So the stuff that I'm saying about them is, you know, born in that kind of experience, uh, you know, seeing how they do last over many years. So um, yeah, very good, very good questions. Very good points. So thank you very much. Um, John says, uh, will they rot? Will they, will they rot meant to say yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, yeah, you just don't want to rot. So no, but I got it from your first time. So that was good. Good. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Thanks very much. Are you making it to the meeting tomorrow? I think I am. I do believe I'm going to make it to the meeting tomorrow. So thanks very much for coming by. That's wonderful. Erdink is here. Hello, Erdink. Thank you very much. I don't know if you're uh, down south or, or back in the UK. Uh, I'm not sure, but welcome. And, and thank you very, very much for coming by. Very nice to see you. John, some people that work with resin have said things uh, live have broke down over time. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, um, if you put something in there live, even if you're going to do like a flower and, and this is a very good point. See, you know, beautiful transition there, John. 
this is the stuff I'm going to use. And this is for my wife. This is from Mrs. Model Craft. And this is for making like coasters and little things like that. And they'll put like live stuff in it. Now, it does pretty good. And there's powders and there's things and preservatives and all that kind of stuff that you can do to plants and things like that. So if you're looking for that, I think, I, I mean, I haven't purchased any of those and I haven't done any of those. I've only done the, the glycerin is the only real preservative that I've used other than just coating things with our normal coats of clear that, you know, we use in modeling. But um, if you want to look for preservatives, I, th that's, I think it would be a good thing. Um, you don't want something breaking down. You don't want something organic continuing to rot. That's why you want to, you know, make sure there's no air, no uh, water in it whatsoever. It can't be wet, you know. Uh, we're not making a terrarium. Uh, I, I'm not trying to be funny. I just, I, I, I really want to make that point. Don't put anything in your diorama that's wet. Um, not good. Not good at all. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. So, uh, and go for it painting. Hello, go for it painting. Thank you very much for coming in. It's really great to see you. Um, and I know I'm not seeing you, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. Um, and then John Hayes says, have you thought of adding another element like uh, geodes? You know, yeah, I, 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 well, number one, what I'm going to do, and we're going to talk about that a little bit too, is I'm going to add some little pools. So the whole thing here is this has gone through quite a change over the time. Uh, and, oh, I got to say, I got one other person. Hello, and it's Rick Lawler. L Rick, thank you very much for coming by. If everybody hasn't been to Propaganda, you got to go there. He did some great stuff this week, uh, and he's got a new video every week something I'm trying to get to. Um, but yeah, um, I, I do have a lot of other element ideas to this. And, and I'm, I, I keep on doing that layering thing. I think that layering thing is something that's really fun. Um, if, if you can get somebody's eye caught, right? We get in there and we're like, we're interested. And then you give them another little step to get a little bit more interested. And then a little bit more. Those layers really help. And, and, and one of the things that I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to draw folks into my diorama. Because if you remember, and I've got the lights going today, um, I've got another camera set up to, to do a much better, and, and why don't even we even just try to give that a shot real quick. Um, this is a little bit better shot, so you can see in here. And I'm going to go real tight. So I've got the um, lights going inside. And one of the things that I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to um, get people to see this and become engaged. They're, they're, they're finding it interesting to the point that they want to get a little bit closer. Well, when they get closer, then I've got another element to try to you know catch their attention because the little fruit things down here that we put in, you can't see until you get real tight. But once you get real tight, whoops, um, it's kind of interesting. And, and, and that might prompt folks to go a little bit deeper into your diorama, a little bit further in. And then you can kind of keep giving them things to you know, discover as they look a little bit deeper. I think that makes it very engaging. What we want to do is we want to try to promote, um, you know, looking at it as long as possible. Let them discover your story. And by telling a story and putting a story there, you're giving them something back for their time. So um, anyway, that was <coughs> kind of what I wanted to get there. Um so far as adding other elements down here at the bottom, what I'm going to do is add some pools. Now, this is a collector. And I'm going to get a little tighter here to see if we can see a little bit better. Whoop, there we go. Sorry, I'm adjusting on the fly here, and it's just really bumming. Um, and I think somebody, uh, John says, lights look uh, light in color instead of blue or red would pop more baby to see the lights. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do um, think that the lights are pretty dim in there. I've tried to keep it as dark and as shadowed as possible, but it is really, it's kind of hard to see them uh, inside there. But when you look close, they're there. So I, I think it looks pretty good. Um, so down here. What I'm trying to do is I've played with two colors throughout the, the build. And those two colors appear in multiple places. And, and those two colors are right here. It's kind of a lime green 
and an orangish red. And those two colors are inside. Those two colors are on uh, Ichiro. Uh, Ichiro has two tanks, and they're supposed to be food for, um, for Carlos. Right there on the bottom, there's two tanks. And again, those same colors, the, the green and the orange. So that repeats throughout. And I'm going to repeat it here one more time. And that, that, that next repeat is going to be down here. There's going to be a small pool here of liquid and a small pool here of liquid. And, and how that supports the story is those two liquids are there to, um, of different colors, those same two colors. I'm going to try to mix that, those colors in the liquid. And those are what's feeding this. In the story, Emma, who's inside in the, uh, in the cryogenic chamber, she's, of course, uh, the botanist, the doctor of the two of them. And so she's been working on this thing and it, nothing worked until the breach in the side, which is right here. There's the breach that happened inside the diorama. And um, that mixing all together, you know, brought on the miracle. So that's why so much green, so much stuff and so much neat, you know, things inside, whereas the outside, you know, very desolate. Um, other than that, I don't think I want much more in there. Um, I am going to have this, and of course, that is the hydroponic table that had, um, you know, plants that were attempting to be grown. And what I'll be doing there is I'll be putting some of these plants that were previously, I'm trying to get it to focus, sorry about that. Um, I'm trying to take these plants, and these plants are going to be planted in there, uh, the like the painted ones, but they're going to be planted in here dead uh, to show that they just didn't work, you know, it didn't take. But these other plants, this new alien uh, plant that's feeding off the chemicals that they've brought to the to the uh, surface here, um, those are what's keeping this thing going. So that's just kind of, um, you know, kind of how I'm supporting the story. Um, so yeah, so that's what's next. But I think it is now, I'm going to show you how I made uh, just these. I've explained it, I think, pretty thoroughly, but I thought it would be fun to show you how I made these, uh, these little uh, fruit. And they're just mustard seeds um, and go over the couple things that are pretty important to do. So I am going to switch my camera one more time and get it down here. And I'm going to check comments real quick before this will be very quick um but i had uh light and color we talked about that john thank you very much hey forest goes seven three thanks very much for coming by i really appreciate that and go for it painting is saying hi to rick lawler and then air Duncan says back to the uk now just too busy with work i missed you a couple times but i'm here thank you very much air Dink. i really appreciate that it's wonderful to see you and link is here wow that's wonderful link wonderful to see you uh have a great one you probably got to get back to work i know this is uh, lunchtime for a lot of folks so i really appreciate you stopping by so now we're going to do this um so here i've just got some mustard seeds here I have not coated them first. Okay, so they have they have no coating on them whatsoever. You know, and, and, and I think Eric Brubaker brought up a really good point. Should we coat them or is there another protective coating? It, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe spray them right now. How am I get everything on there and make sure I get all around it? I don't know. I don't want to submerge them in anything really because of the, the possibility of the husk coming off. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, plus, if I try to airbrush this or spray anything on it, they're going to go everywhere. They're very, very lightweight. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of my purple paint, and I just want to put straight paint. I don't want a heck of a lot of water in there because of the issue of, um, you know, uh, just taking the husk off these guys. So you can see I'm just kind of dabbing the paint in there. And you're saying, wow, great demo, Bill. But give me a second, because there's a couple of things that are pretty important. And um, that really comes to when you think you've got the paint on them. So I'm not going to do them all. Uh, but now I need to separate them. And that's the important bit. If you try to do this and just think about you know, oh, I'm just going to leave them there. And, you know, once they're dry, I'll take them out. It don't work. 
that's one of the things that can cause the husk on each of these little tiny seeds to pop right off. So we don't want to do that. So all I do is I, as I bring them out like that and I separate them and it just makes it so much easier uh, when I go to add them to the diorama. So once I've got a few of those and I've got some other ones here from the first time I did it, once I got those guys, they're just really easy to work with, you know, uh, and, and see, here's some of the ones that are still stuck together. And that's what I'm saying. When they're stuck together, they're, they're really hard to work with. So try to get them separated before. And then you've got a very nicely painted uh, little seed. And again, for one uh, thirty-fifth scale, these are perfect scale for oranges and apples in that kind of a diorama. So uh, that's why, and, and I've used them as that in those scales. Um, so then I just take this and I glue it to the diorama. So we're going to, this is like some high speed uh, live streaming here. You know, you don't get this kind of quality everywhere. Um, now what I'm using, and I, I, I've made points to this before. I personally like um, to use scenic, uh, Woodland Scenics, you know, scenic glue and, and, and their stuff and Mod Podge. Um, I'm not going to use that for the water because I've had some, some negative effects with the water. Other people have had some negative effects with water. I, I had said previously I hadn't, but then I looked at one of my old dioramas and it shrunk um, pretty darn bad. And, and I wasn't real happy with it. So anyway, um, I'm going to get real tight here and just show you how I put these on. And as you can imagine, the highly <clears throat> technical method I'm using here is the find a place I want it and I put it there, and that's about where it ends. So that's it. The fun thing is, sorry, that was maybe a letdown. Uh, but the fun thing is, is when I get these all on there, it's it's that pattern where they're all a quarter inch away from each other. And, and I think that's a real fun pattern because your eye doesn't immediately pick it up, but you get this kind of a matrix uh, feel. I don't want to necessarily do rows. I was trying to stay away from that. But by having them a quarter of an inch away and not having any bunches, it looks odd. It looks a little bit off. Now, I, I don't know if you can see this one, and that's why the white dots. But down here is the one that I just did, and, and it doesn't stand out. I didn't think it stood out enough as a fruit or, or something that I wanted there to display. I wanted somebody to find it. Now, from a far distance, and let's do this because I think it works good. From here, you're not going to really see it that well, but hopefully these flowers up top are going to grab your attention so you want to come in. So that's why they're also brightly colored. The green is a neon kind of a green, brightly colored, trying to draw your eye in. These then give a different level or layer of it. That draws your eye in. There's lights coming through from uh, Carlos from the other side. That draws you in. As you get closer, then you see these. I think the other thing that inspired me is like... Um, uh, you know, frog eggs, uh, a clutch of polywogs or, or frog eggs. Um, I thought they had that kind of a look. And I've always thought that was a beautiful look, just the image. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with those. So the next thing we're going to talk about is groundwork. Now, again, I, I told you, I'm going to show you my, um, I'm going to bring the camera back here to Mian's. Um, so I told you before, I'm, I'm showing you, you know, like my alien plant life or fruit or something like that. Um, what would you put? You know, what, what other things? Um, I like to look at, well, I did look a lot at, you know, some of the old science magazines back in the 80s and stuff like that. And I just tried to, like I said before, use the colors that I know people are going to associate with a plant first off. I think that's pretty important. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, a friend of mine this past week sent me a really cute little anecdote about Star Trek and Gene Roddenberry wasn't happy with some of the, the plants that they had. They said, didn't look like an alien plant. And so Gene Roddenberry took one of the plants. It was a potted plant, pulled it out, stuck it back into the pot upside down. He said, that is an alien plant. So, you know, trying to make it kind of look like it, 
but you know, not so far out of the realm that like, what is it? You don't want them to just like be completely confused. It's it's gotta it's gotta have something that ties toward the story you're telling. You don't want it so obscure that it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Unless there's some other kind of narrative that does draw them in and tell them exactly what it is. So um, yeah, when you're thinking of your alien plants, um, just try to think fun, number one, but also try to use some things that are familiar that are going to get the story across, but then also take it to some place that it's like, well, that's not on earth. I've never seen anything like that, but I know it's a plant. Okay. So now, um, and, and John says, uh, plants are colorful. Absolutely. And produce flowers. Very good. So, and that was the other thing is, you know, trying to get a flower that kind of looks like a flower. Um, you know, I didn't want it to have, you know, look exactly like a flower. So I thought it was important. Like here, as you see, uh, in this, the flower part of it, it still has the same kind of things. You know, what's a flower there to do? It's, it's meant to draw the insect, the pollinating insect to the center. And so I just kind of kept that in mind as I was doing these triangular kind of, I don't know what's hanging up high. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They're also, they're meant to gather light and gather sun gather any kind of energy that they can and then transmit that down through the plant into the fruit that's that's on the bottom floor. So I'm just I'm still using, you know, those those basic tropes of this is a plant, um, but I'm trying to couch it in some way to make it look uh, alien. OK, so I'm going to move on now if nobody and, and certainly if you have questions, ask. We, I want to answer any question. I, I think sometimes I talk too much and I don't answer enough questions. And, and, you know, I don't want to be that guy. So um, what I'm going to do now is we're going to look at the ground. Um, that was our demo. So here's the ground. Now, the ground is not a big deal, right? I mean, you just throw a little dirt down there, blah, blah, blah. Well, I wanted to accomplish a couple of things. Remember, I talked about the pools. Here's where we can see real clearly where those pools are going to be. And those pools are, are specifically there because... To the right is going to be that big hydroponic table. I can't have them there. I, you know, I could have it in the hydroponic table, but it wouldn't, eh, wouldn't work really well. So I've got on this collector, I've got two uh, cables coming down, one going to one pond, the other one that's going to go to the other pond or pool. And, and that's what, you know, I'm, I'm going to fill with some uh, liquid. Here's what it looked like before I did anything. And if you remember in building this, I had done this very intricate, fun, triangular pattern scribed on the floor to make this real kind of sciencey, I thought, lab habitat looking floor. Well, once this is all said and done, you're not going to see a bit of it. And, and I thought that was something that I should mention. Because, you know, when, when looking at these kinds of things and trying to determine, you know, what you should and shouldn't do in your diorama, don't become so enamored with one thing that it destroys your original goal. You know, not destroys it maybe, but you're trying to accommodate this. I made this really cool thing or, or this is the best thing ever, or I really want to show this off. Well, you know, if it's not in there serving the story and it sometimes kind of distracts from the story and it, and it, and it, and it forces the viewer to kind of do something that doesn't flow with your story. I think you just got to be brutal and you just got to cut it. You know, and I'm not saying cut it, it's still there, but it's going to be so totally hidden, you're not even going to see it. I know it's there. Great. I'll use it on something else later. That's totally fine. I'm not taking it out. You know, it's the floor. But to get the effect of it, I'm completely destroying the effect of it for the purpose of telling the story of the diorama and to make the diorama more interesting. So I, I just, I wanted to mention that because I, I I, I got hung up on that before. I, I did. I did get hung up on some stuff before. I'm like, no, it's got to be like this. And, 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 and it didn't work, right? It just didn't work. It threw the story, not in this diorama, but it didn't work in this old diorama that I was trying. So 
Think about it. So, and, and sometimes just if the part's not working, if that component is not working, it is a component, it can be removed and you could possibly use it in another diorama. So don't fret over that kind of stuff. Um, it serves the story better to just, destroy, well, not destroy it, but, but to just completely cover it up for the floor, okay? So this is what I was uh, dealing with. I had to figure out, you know, how to make a floor out of this. Um, and I have, you know, my, my plants that are coming down. I've just got very limited room. Um, and so I just had to figure, well, number one, where am I going to put this filler? Let me see how I did it here. So what we're doing here is we're looking real tight into the lower section. Um, I wanted that to look like this stuff has been coming up in here. There's maybe been wind whipping through here. You know, there's been all kinds of things. I wanted this to look natural. So I just built this up against that. Secondarily, that becomes a dam. That is a dam against the back wall for the liquid that I'm going to be pouring in a little bit later on. So today in the second demo, what I'm going to do is we're going to prepare this to get that liquid poured into because I'm going to paint them. I'm not going to just leave them the way they are and count on the pigment that I'm going to put in this clear liquid. No, I'm going to actually paint inside those two little pools um, to put the color in. And uh, once I pour over it, the pigment will have or the the acrylic uh, epoxy that I'm putting in there will have some pigment in it. Uh, those two colors, but I'm also going to paint the bottoms of these two little areas. Okay. So I think that's just, it's it, for me, I think that's going to work better. The other thing I have to think of is when I'm adding something like this a little bit later in the game, how is it affecting the rest of the stuff I'm doing? How is it going to maybe change the position of, of things? How is it going to affect the overall look? Now, I knew I was going to do this from the start, so I, 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 was, I was prepared. But sometimes things like this happen. So in that example, I'm using this, this uh, hose that you see. So this picture is showing a collector. This collector has two hoses coming out of the top. Um, those are coming down in the pools. That's how the pools are going to have separate uh, liquids in them. Um, but filling in around this, I almost completely cover up this hose. Well, I think it's going to enhance it. I think it's going to make it look good. This is going to be painted. That hose going in there will be painted separately. It'll have its own character. I'm going to have it stand out. I don't want it to fall to the background. I'm adding, by doing this, more uh, interest uh, more complexity, another layer of detail. So it ends up being great. So, you know, late on in the, in the process, don't think that you're done and you're just trying to finish up. You could find something like this where, wait a minute, I'm going to be able to do something a lot cooler here. Again, I knew I was going to do parts of this, but I'm discovering as I do it that I'm going to do a little bit more than I initially thought. So that's just one of the things that uh, I, I think is really, really fun about it. Um, the, uh, how this transitions into the ground, I haven't figured out yet. The plant, the plant is mostly suspended in this little green matrix, but I do want to have something coming down to the ground. I want somebody that gets super tight on this. You know, they're just fascinated by it, which is my hope. Obviously I want somebody to find something underneath this because there's a little canopy created by that plant underneath there where it's over the other hydroponic table that's been completely consumed. Um, that has, so I want something in that little area. Um, and I think John Hayes had a comment here. Algae. Yeah, I do. Snakes and slithering creature. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, uh, you are a wealth of knowledge, my friend. Thank you very much, Link. I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, a, di uh, a diagram logo on floor covered by a spill only have some letters of li making you want to. Hey, that's really cool. I like that idea so that there's some writing down there and it only, I always like that kind of an idea where you just get part of the puzzle and, uh, you know, movies use it a lot. I think it's a really fun thing to, to have that. But, um, I think of beyond that now, though I could paint something in. No, I, I just, I want to do something, uh, 
just kind of a little bit different. I, 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 I'm even thinking about having a little tiny, tiny, tiny animal coming up to one of these pools, like it's a, a water hole, you know, out in the middle of the Sahara. So I don't know, but we'll, we'll have to see. I, I don't know if I want to introduce an animal that might be a little bit too far, but it also could be kind of fun. So anyway, let's see, where is we at? Uh, that's just some more of the transition. You see on the right-hand side there in this picture where this did not uh, get some dirt. So that's what I'm covering up. That's, that's the transition I'm trying to create. I want this to blend, you know, seamlessly with the floor and that's what it used to look like. So uh, I need to get back in there and get some more done on it. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of the examples. Uh, and now we got our second demonstration. So in this demo, what I would like to do is show you how I paint these areas and I'm going to swap cameras here. I'm going to show you how I paint these areas to accept the water or the, you know, it's not water, it's a chemical. Um, that uh, is being added in the hydroponics. And so that chemical in the hydroponics is what we're trying to simulate. And I am just gonna get my paint here. So I, these are Tamiya paints. So I gotta do a little bit of, of work here. Um, and I'm also going to bring this a little closer so you get a little bit better shot. If anybody has any questions, right now is a perfect time to type them because I am just trying to get this in the, in the right view for you. Okay, that looks good. And then we'll do this. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so the paints that I use are XF4 yellow green, and uh, that might be too close for it to, uh, but XF4 yellow green, XF7 flat red, and uh, X6 orange. And I've done two different mixes to get the orange color that I'm gonna be using. Um, this mix is, I, I, I'm gonna see what it looks like. I may go red and yellow. Uh, but I've done yellow and red and red and orange, and I think it's the orange that I want to go with. It's, it's going to be not as orange with the red. Um, and there's no trick to doing this, and it's really so shallow. It's not like it's going to be uh, something that is as detailed as like a, like a channel or something like that. Uh, you know, like if you're, if you were doing a, a deep water channel, but I still think it's fun. And, and, you know, I've said this before, I like to practice these things as I do them. So I'm just getting a little bit of red and I'm going to come back and get a little bit of orange. And it's giving me the color I want, but I want to go a little bit more red. So it's darker. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this, and I'm going to start in the center, and I want to go all the way out. And this is my darkest color that I'm going to be using here. I have previously painted Mod Podge over the bottom here and on top of this that's already been laid in. Okay, so now after I do that, I'm just going to continue adding a little bit of orange to the same red. And each time I add that, it gets a little lighter. And then I'm just gonna come around the outside and just ring the outside of that. I don't wanna go too high up. And then the last one, I'm almost all orange. And we're gonna blend these. And I'm not worried if I'm getting too much here and there because this other stuff has gotta be painted too. Now I'm just going to come back with a little bit of thinner, not a bunch. I don't want to throw a bunch of thinner on this thing, but I'm just going to come in here and just dab. It should be blotchy. What you're trying to do is achieve lighter color near the edge and a deeper color 
in the center. You can add black, you can add darker colors and grays and stuff like that. I don't think it's necessary. I just want to go with my darkest tone. I'm going with a little bit more in here. And that's it. I, I, you know, this is a puddle. If you're doing a stream, if you're doing a pond, if you're doing something like that, the graduations are going to be a lot more uh, specific. Um, and then when you bring it in, you can kind of see changes in the shoreline too. And what I mean by changes in the shoreline, underwater, when I'm doing this, I'm just basically doing you know, an oval, right? I've got the first layer that's deepest and the darkest, and then the second layer is just kind of an oval around it. But if you're doing like a coastline inside of a big deep something, it's really cool because you're doing stuff like this where it's changing. And so you're using that, that, that paint underneath your acrylic to make changes to the tone. It looks really great. It's just a fantastic effect. Uh, the, my favorite guy doing it is Marklin of Sweden. Um, I love to see him do water. He uses toilet paper to do his water, but it's just absolutely brilliant. So now this is the other color. Now this one, because I only have one color, I am gonna use probably like black, you know? I just, I need to get something in there to darken the lower portions. I don't wanna necessarily go with white. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use a little bit of black at the bottom once I get this in here. One of these is bigger, that's okay. Um, that's the other thing, you know, um, the fact that I can do this model, the machining Krieger, and not worry so much about Canon or, you know, is that historically accurate? Um, that's one of the things that makes it so fun to do this machining Krieger diorama. It, it really allowed me to play. And um, I think that's, that's a huge part of it. If you're not enjoying it, well, there's there's something that you might want to look at. Um, okay, I am gonna do. I'm just gonna do some black, and I'm gonna I'm gonna basically go right in the center, just with one little blotch of black, and then start blending that outward. And it's you know, I don't want too much. I just want a little bit. So I'm gonna go out of the cap. So that's one good load on the cap. And I'm just gonna go right in the center. And it's and it's relatively wet down there. I think I'll clean the rest of that off. And now I'm just gonna blotch. And as I work my way out, it just gets lighter. Do we sound like Bob Ross? Happy little water chemical in an alien planet. I don't think Bob ever did anything alien planety, but he would have done it justice, I'm sure. Okay, I think I want a little bit more, a little darker. So that is the base. And before I pour anything on it, it has to be totally dry. And I'm not gonna go with my acrylic I'm sorry, I keep saying acrylic. I think it's acrylic. Uh, but the epoxy resin, uh, technically, I'm not going to do that until um, that's completely dry. And I put something else on it. I want to put something else clear over that before I go to that. Uh, and, and this too. So I'll probably do that prior to, um, prior to, to pouring that stuff on. And I'm not going to pour that on today. I'm not going to do that here because this has to dry, of course, but I wanted you to see how I go about this and how I go about shading these guys. I just put a big blotch in there. I'm trying to blend in a little bit. Um, up here on the sides, I want to treat those like, you know, I, I think I've said it before. I treat the, the ground just like I treat the top of a tank or, or an airplane or whatever, the ground needs to have as much attention as you put anywhere else in your diorama. Um, that's really and super important. Um, if you want people to look at it, give them something to look at, give them something interesting, do your best job on every single thing to include your groundwork. Don't, I'm, <sighs> there's been a lot said lately about freeloading. Um, I, I, I almost said that. Um, 
don't skimp on yourself, you know, uh, give it what it's worth, give it what you think it's worth. And I think you're going to get a, a lot out of it. Um, number one, by getting this stuff in here, I'm just, like I said before, adding layers and layers of complexity and interest and detail. And um, anywhere I can find, instead of saying, yeah, that would be kind of cool, I just do it. I just go and, yeah, let's do it, okay? So uh, the rest of the work here is going to continue after we're done. Uh, I've got to paint these lines, you know, but I want that to dry. These lines will be different, and then they'll be aged and stuff like that, and um, I was even thinking about bubbles. So this is a good question for everybody out there. Does anybody know how to do bubbles? I'm going to change the camera here because that's what I need to do next is bubbles. I would like to have the, um, the liquids that I have here bubbling. And I'm thinking about it and I'm like, well, how, how in the heck would I do that? You know, um, I did try to make a bubble um, out of uh, Mod Podge. And that would be fine, because if it, if it dries, it'll be clear, you know? And then I thought I could put that in there and then just pour over it and it would hold. I don't know. Um, but I'd like to do bubbles. I even thought of getting like a, um, a clear piece of acrylic and turning it, because I've got a little tiny machinist lathe and turning around and then cutting that round, you know, so it looks like a bubble. But anyway, that's what I'm going to try to do, too. I would like to see this stuff bubbling and, and working and, you know, oozing about and stuff like that when I do get those chemicals in there. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about doing. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da and let's see. Chemical. Uh, Oscar. Have green. I'm sorry, guy. I'm just trying to get all your comments in here, and I just got to see where I left off. So there's algae dyer logo. Okay. Um, have green plants started to take over the guy outside? Well, I, he's moving. I mean, he's not standing there too much. Yeah. So I don't want it. I don't want the plants to be aggressive. What I want to have, you know, a, as this story unfolds here, you know, this is like the culmination of this entire four year journey. Well, longer than that, four years since they hit Atmo. Um, so the, the culmination is him finding Emma and they're able to stay and colonize this planet because what she was trying to do here worked. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed. That's the end game. And, and so that's really what I want. Um, I, I, I want it to be a good ending. You know, I love good endings, you know, so that's where it's looking at next. Uh, reminds me of the blob taking over type effect. Yeah. I like the blob. I think the blob was great. Uh, happy little chemical putty. Exactly. Um, and I'd like to be able to get those bubbles in various shapes or not shapes, but sizes, you know, so I don't know, man, I got to figure something out. Link spent many hours in the woods. The ground is its own universe. Absolutely. The ground is not one color. The ground is not one material. The ground is everything in, in, an abbreviated vertical space because everything up there comes down. Um, I got a chance to go to the jungle uh, many, many years ago. And boy, I got to tell you, that was amazing. And seeing all that life in such compact, small areas, you know, you're, you're, you move and you can walk 15, 20 feet and you're in another little biosphere. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, John says hot glue drops. That's a great idea, John. I like that a lot. And I wonder if after the glue drop, has dropped, right? So we've got it there. If there's a little dimple or something like that, if I took a little heat to it, I could I could get that to settle down. I don't know. Because sometimes, you know, the little stringy bits, not a fan of those. But I like that very much. Yeah, so I got to make some some bubbles and, and the glue drops would work. Because it doesn't have to be clear. You know, I don't think at all it has to be clear. I would probably put down my first coat, only, you know, a little small eighth inch, coat let that dry 24 hours and then put the bubble and then do a coat over the bubble is is what i'm thinking so that's great i like that john that's a great idea we might have to try that tonight um so that's the other thing folks um uh each friday for my top tier patreon folks and evan is is out of the country uh, so he's not going to join us tonight. So it's just going to be me and John tonight. Uh, we have Di Diorama Friday Night Live. And it's from 6 to 9 p.m. And so it's a group. 
and we just get on and it's not like this where it's only texting. It's like, you know, we both have the video going and we can talk and we talk about stuff. And like this, we're going to try that tonight. I think that's brilliant. So I'm very excited about that, John. Um, and so that's for my uh, top tier Patreon folks and, and check out Patreon because my Patreon is pretty cool. Um, yes, could give you different sizes too. clear glue. I like it. I like it. And I've got, think I've got some other like silicones might work too, you know, because a silicone might sit long enough to get the top to not have the little drippy pointy thing. Uh, I'm sure there's a scientific name for that and becoming a scientist is not my thing. So I'm not going to figure it out. John Hayes Hobby Lobby has micro beads glass. Ooh, that's a really good idea. You know, if they're little plastic beads or something that I could cut in half or, I mean, they could be whole, and just, you know, fill it so it's only half. Perfect. That's that's the same thing. That's great. I like that, John. Thanks very much. Well, folks, uh, I, I don't have anything else really. And, you know, uh, all different colors too. I'd like to have clear possibly. But I think we're going to look and see what... I've got some silicone. And I think we're going to look and see what we can do with that hot glue tonight. And see if we can get that. Because that, I mean, this isn't going to be ready to pour tonight. That's got to go overnight. It's probably going to be a couple days before I pour. So I got a couple days to kind of figure out, right, how to make these bubbles, how to make them look cool enough that they actually look like a bubbling pool of ooze of something or other. Um, and I want the, the, the liquid to be just so you can see that it's transparent. I don't want to see the bottom, right? I, I did that darkening, that painting in there to give it some shade, to give it some shadow, to give it some looks like depth, but we know it's not very deep, but I still, I don't want to see it. I only want to see like the, I don't know what the heck you call it, but you just can't quite see it. So that, that liquid, I'm going to put enough paint in it so that um, it's almost opaque, but not quite. That's my goal at least. I've, I've not used this particular product. I only need a teeny tiny bit, but I do know that when I went back and looked at my water stuff for um, the Woodland Scenics, so it, it, okay, so you put your dam up against the side of what you're going to pour it into, right? Here's the dam. Here's the surface you're pouring it on. And when you're done, you pull away the dam. And so then you've got this nice square side to your water. Well, on the Woodland Scenic side I did, and this is probably five or six years ago, that side, so now this is, we're going to say this is the side of the water and this is the surface of the water. It did this over time. So that, that water itself continues to shrink over time. And that's what I don't want. That, I think, and that, again, is Woodland Scenic's water. Um, and that's this. That's realistic water from Woodland Scenic's. I don't want that. So the what I'm using is a two-part one-to-one, which is really nice, makes it really easy to mix, a one-to-one -one, um, epoxy. And um, it's supposed to be clear. It's a little old. It's a little yellow. <laughs> it's not that big a deal, though. Again, I'm going to have it mostly colored. And so that's what I'm going to drop into those two deals. And uh, I think it'll be pretty cool. So, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, water drop paint effect may work. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going for. Um, John Hayes, not sure. Yeah. But thank you, everybody. You know, I do want to mention, I, I've got some patron folks, uh, and, and they're fantastic. They are just the greatest folks ever. They, um, help me keep the channel going, right? Uh, I do all this and, and I love showing you and love teaching. I love talking to everybody. And uh, so uh, the patron helps pay for that. So, and I'm also gonna, I'm, I'm also working on my latest video that's coming up soon. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And that is like the full on building of this thing. You know, I did the building of the geodesic dome. I did the building of Carlos, um, our raccoon guy. Uh, but what I have not done is showing you like all the detailed stuff of putting this together. Well, that's what's coming up.
So uh, that is a long form video that I'm working on. And man, I'm hoping it's done soon. It's a son of a gun, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And, and I hope you like it. Uh, Scott says, thank you, Bill, for all your work and helping grow our knowledge. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate you guys coming by. It's so cool. And to get your questions throughout the week and comments, you know, that helps to put the show together again. Um, John Hayes with his just brilliant idea of using Mod Podge and water on cloth gives me a really nice cloth. I really love using this. If anybody wants to see an actual demo of it, we can do that. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, get it wet with Mod Podge, hang it, it's done. Um, but yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff is super cool to me. I, I, I really enjoy it. And my patrons, when we do these calls, like the group call tonight, we talk about all that kind of stuff. And we come up with stuff and ideas and all that kind of stuff. So I really enjoy it. Uh, I hope if you're interested, you can come to the on my patron site. It is uh, Scale Model Craft on Patreon. Uh, I would love to see you there. It also has Discord. And John did post his project on discord this week and it was brilliant he made this flower and it has a light in it uh he 3d printed it and i think he designed it and everything and it's very cool looking and so we're going to talk about that tonight so um thanks very much everybody i really enjoyed it uh and i hope everybody has just a wonderful weekend and we'll see you later have a good one bye-bye